morning, church. Join with me in prayer. Lord, you said, open your mouth wide and I will fill it. Lord, help us to come hungry, to come expecting, Lord. In expectation, faith is an expectation, God. Help us to be expectant, like Noah was, preparing for the flood, like Abraham was, going out to the land you sent him to, like Moses' mother was, who hid her son, knowing what was to come. Lord, help us to be expectant of revelation as we prepare for the return of Jesus Christ. Help us to prepare in this word, God. Open our hearts to receive. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For those who don't know me, I am Brandon. Uh, I've been coming to this church for about a year and a half, and I'm an intern here. I go to the local cemetery. I mean seminary. It's pretty much like a, like a cemetery. Um, there is a death and a resurrection there. But um, yeah, I am here, and I'm still standing. And so I'm so thankful to be here um, with you today. If you were with us for the past two weeks, we've been in a series on Colossians, and we're going to be in Colossians chapter 3 today, so if you have your Bibles with you or your phone apps, feel free to get those open. Um, But last week we talked about, one, one of the points that I pulled out from Rachel's sermon was that we are enough for Jesus. We are enough for Jesus. And the week before that, Pastor Brian pointed out how Jesus is enough for us. Paul is writing to a church who was wandering away from the way. And Jesus is enough for us. We're enough for him. And today we're going to be really digging into enough is enough. It's time to seek the Lord. Hosea chapter 10 verse 12, a favorite verse of mine, talks about sowing for yourselves righteousness. And reap steadfast love. This is the Lord speaking. Break up your fallow ground. Break up your fallow ground. When a farmer had territory, fallow ground was ground that was left idle. Ground that was unused. Ground that was overgrown. And there are areas in our life that are overgrown, people of God. There are areas in our life where we have been idle. If we are aware And God wants to make us aware of that so that we would sow into what he is bringing out of us, what he is seeking to harvest, which is to reap steadfast love, his loving kindness coming out of our own lives. And how does this come about? Break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord. So it is in seeking the Lord that this ground, the plow is put down into the ground and the clods are broken up so that seed can be sown. It is time to seek the Lord, that he may come and rain righteousness upon you. Real quick, Gavin, what time is it? No, it's time to seek the Lord. (laughs) I always get my daughter with that. Uh, My daughter will ask, Daddy, what time is it? Because, and she doesn't really know time like that. She's two. But because my wife and I, we talk about time, you know, uh, she'll ask, and I'll be like, it's time to seek the Lord, honey. It's time to seek the Lord, and we'll do a little prayer time. And then sometimes she'll be like, Daddy, you know, what time is it? And and I have to really tell her. Um, And so, you know, Colossians, later on, we're not going to talk about this verse, but, well, I'm going to talk about it now. Uh, It talks about don't uh, provoke your children to anger. So I'm like, careful. I'm like, all right, Lord, I can't be saying that too much. Like, I got to tell her time. Um, So, yeah, it is time to seek the Lord. He wants to reign righteousness. That is beautiful. God is willing to give. But we've got to do something in return. We've got to enact our faith. If you were here for the midweek formation night, I didn't even plan to talk about this until I went to the midweek formation night, and it was, um, there was a great point in there among several that Pastor Brian pointed out, which was that God can do the unexpected in the darkest of times. It doesn't matter the circumstance. It doesn't matter what this world is going through, what you're going through. God is the God of the unexpected. Whether he showed up for Daniel in the lion's den, whether he showed up for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace, and whether it came at the last minute. 
It was in God's timing. And so we see this with Paul as he seeks the Lord, as he realizes the time is at hand. Because one of the themes that comes out in Colossians chapter 3 is Paul's talking about seek the things that are above. Seek these things that are above, and he's pulling. Remember, Paul is a, is a former Pharisee, a Jew who was very uh, trained, well-versed in the Old Testament, his own Bible, Jesus' Bible, all the New Testament writers' Bible was the Old Testament. And it was the promises of God being revealed to us. And so Paul was understanding this fervent seeking of the Lord that the prophets were calling us to. And yet he finds himself in prison. He found purpose in the prison. Some of his greatest letters came out of prison. We have Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. Four letters that came out of Paul's prison times. And now these weren't, you know, our prisons today, three hots and a cot. You know, they, you weren't getting meals all, at various times of the day unless somebody brought them to you. You were in chains. You were in shackles. You know, prisoners from then... If they were taken into some of the prisons today, they, they might think they were at the Hilton. You know, it's like totally different, right? So Paul is in a dark, literally dark circumstance. And yet he finds purpose in the prison. Some of his greatest letters come out of there. And, and this is what I wanted to say about that, why I'm bringing that up, is some of, some of God's letters are in you. Some of God's prison letters are in you. What letters will come out of you from prison? What letters will come out of you from your problems? But we got to have our mind at the right place, the right focus, right? If we allow the circumstance to determine our, 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 our happiness, our joy, well, that's part of why they call happiness happiness. It's based on happenings. But joy is based on the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Come on. Joy is based on an indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And so, some of your most powerful tools of deliverance will be delivered to you in prison. See your prison as an opportunity to find God. See your problems as an opportunity to meet God. We'll talk about in a little bit how Jacob meets God before he crosses this river back to his homeland where he's coming to face his biggest problem, his brother who wants to kill him. At least so he thinks. And in meeting his problem, he finds the face of God. And then he, when he crosses that river after wrestling with God, he sees his brother Esau and he says, seeing you is like seeing the face of God. What if we came to our problems like that where we said, God, I know in the midst of this problem, I'm going to see your face. I know in the midst of this sin I'm wrestling with, this thing I'm overcoming, I know I'm going to see you more clearly. Come on. God is faithful. He's willing to take us if we'll take that journey. So let's look into Colossians chapter 3, the first few verses there. It says, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated, or where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. I love how Paul begins this because he has a conditional if, right? If this, then this. If you have actually been raised with Christ, then this is ought to be the result. You ought to be seeking the things that are above if you've actually been risen with Christ. Jesus uh, talks about this widow woman who, who, who sought fervently from a judge justice. And he uses this as a parallel for prayer and persistent pursuit of God. And he, and he says, at the close of that parable, he says, "How if this wicked judge answers this widow woman because of her persistence, and he doesn't care about her justice, he just cares because she's just so persistent, how much more will your Father in heaven answer you, answer his children who seek him day and night? And then he says, but when the Son of Man returns, he's talking about himself, the Son of Man is a title from Daniel 7, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith? Will he find faith? So there's that conditional, if then you have been raised with Christ. Are, are you actually raised? Are you actually saved? Do you know your salvation? Are you having what Colossians 2 talks about where Paul says, I want you to know the full assurance of your faith. 
to know fully assured, right? We've got all types of insurances, house insurance, car insurance, but, but, and, and, and some of those coverages aren't fully insured. Are, are, are we fully insured in the Lord, though? Are we fully insured in Him? The promise is yes. We've got to take it. We've got to take it. And so, even that phrase, though, if then you have been raised with Christ, He's picking up from the theme in Colossians 2, where he basically, it's a, it's a great passage of Colossians 2, verses 10 through 13, but you get this passive tense of what's happening. In, in, the, in the Greek, what is actually happening is basically the focus is on what God has already done for believers. By our faith in the death, resurrection of Jesus Christ, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. God is doing something in you. Because Paul says in Colossians 2, you have been filled in him. That's God doing the work. You have been filled in him, who is the head and rule of, our, and rule of all authority. In him also you were circumcised. He keeps going. Having been buried with him, you were also raised with him through faith. God made you alive together with him. So when Paul jumps into Colossians 3, if then you have been raised with Christ, the focus is the work of God upon believers, not our work. The central thread here is God's action in our reception thereof. And so then we have that causal result. If this has actually happened, if you're actually saved, seek the things that are above. I like how the NASB translate, translates this passage because it captures the present tense of the verb here, where it talks about seek the things that are above. It says, keep seeking in the NSB. Keep seeking. There's that sentiment held in this scripture, which is that you ought to keep on going. When Jesus says, ask and it shall be given to you, knock and the door will be opened, seek and you shall find, it's the same thing. It's a command, but it's in the present tense. So in other words, it's not just a one-time thing. You know, I've met people where, in my, in my witnessing in the streets, I've met people who are, who are like, well, I tried that. I tried that. So you, and, and my response is, so you're telling me God's a liar. You're telling me God's not faithful with his promise. Because let me tell you, I, oh my God, any saint knows if you've taken and held God's scripture, take him for his word. Take and hold fast to his word. His promises are faithful. For example, he says, if you seek me, with all your heart, you will find me. With all your heart. That's, that's the big part of that. Not just some, not just kind of. Any, any person who struggles with faith, I myself struggle with faith at times. And, and, but, but I'm talking about where you don't even have faith at all. My, my imposition to them is try God out on his promise. See what happens. Seek him with all your heart. Actually go after this. And I guarantee you, I, it's because it's not me guaranteeing. It's God already guaranteed it. He said, draw near to me and I will draw near to you. If anyone would seek after God, they must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Hebrews chapter 11. He, God's actually seeking to reward people who seek him. Like that's what his scripture says. That might sound counterintuitive. Like, oh, I shouldn't be seeking a reward. Yeah, you should. You should seek the reward in Christ. He is the reward. And so there is a difference, right? Especially among, when, when, you know, when we're like struggling in faith, wobbling in faith, where you can be seeking the hand of God rather than the face of God. You can be seeking blessings from God rather than the blessing himself. And, and I'm not saying that, that we can't do that at times. We can't say, God, I, I, I need help with this bill. God, I, I need help with this relationship. There are times where, absolutely, God says, ask of him and call upon him. He knows what you need before you ask, right? But there's also a greater intimacy God is looking for among us. And so keep seeking. And then we move on. It says, set your minds on the things that are above. Set your minds on the things that are above. I like the way the King James Version translates this. It says, set your affection on so it, it captures not just the mind. The word in the Greek captures not just the mind, but the heart. It's saying, set, let your emotions be determined by seeking God. Not the circumstances, not the problem, not the prison. Let your emotions, let your affections be ruled by God. The first appearance of that term, set your minds on the things that are above. 
or just the set your mind part. The first appearance is in Matthew 16, verse 23, where Peter is, is, is telling Jesus, you'll never die, Jesus. No, far be it from you. And he just got finished telling Jesus that he is the Messiah and Jesus saying, the Father has revealed this to you. So Jesus was honoring Peter. And then just like that, Jesus says, I'm going to die. And, I'm the, and three days later, I'm going to rise from the dead. And Peter's like, no, that is not going to happen. He can't see past the earthly mindset of how things ought to work, how our minds think things should work. And, and Jesus says to him, get behind me, Satan. You're a hindrance to me. You're a stumbling block to me. For you're setting your mind on the things of man and not on the things of God. How often is it the satanic mindset is what the earthly mindset is? Where we set our minds on the things of this earth and not on the things of God. But what are the things? What are these things of God? If we look, there's multiple things. There's multiple things because it's a plural. But first and foremost, we can look and see what Paul says right after it. Seek the things that are above where Christ is. So what are we doing? We're seeking where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God. In that right hand of God, it's, it's, there's so much juice there that I'm not going to be able to squeeze out right now. But Psalm 16 verse 11 says this, you make known to me the path of life, God, In your presence, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand, at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. That is why I seek God each and every day when I wake up, when I feel the weight of the world, when I feel the thoughts of depression, when I feel the thoughts of anxiety coming upon me. I say, Lord, hold on. (laughs) Get behind me, Satan. Here I am, Jesus. I need to set my mind on the things that are above because at your right hand are pleasures forevermore and I've tasted and seen the goodness of God like Peter said. Peter Peter commissions us in 1 Peter chapter 2. He says, if you've tasted and seen the goodness of God, then you ought to press on, right? How many of us have had moments and twinklings and glimmers of those, those, those star shining moments in our lives where God has come in majestic power we can reflect back and just absorb the goodness of God. Wow, God, you saved me from that. Wow, God, you delivered me from that. Wow, God, you brought me here. And and, and that ought to encourage us to keep pressing in to the goodness of God, to the things that are above pleasures forevermore, multiple pleasures, all kinds of things God is giving, so many low-hanging fruits on the tree of God. Colossians 2.3 says, In Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, Paul is talking to a people at Colossae who were meandering away from the faith and they were wandering into plausible arguments of philosophy and wisdom and asceticism. You, you name it. It was Jesus plus. That was the faith. Jesus plus. We don't have a Jesus plus faith, people of God. Not if we're going to get deeper. Not if we're going to seek the hidden treasures in Christ. They're hidden. They're not in plain sight we got to press in. There are things that are in plain sight. The cross of Jesus Christ is plain. It's so plain. In fact, that's why the the, the, the scripture says in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 that in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. But it was the foolishness of the cross. It's this foolish thing. Wait, God, you put your son on a tree to die for me? I don't know if I understand that. That just seems counterintuitive to the way I think it should work. If you're God, why don't you do this? You should do it this way. How often do we position ourselves in that? Come on, I'm guilty of that. God, you, you should do it like this. When I was an atheist, that's how I used to think. I'm just like, God, I'm not, I'm not doing this until you do this. But God's purposes are clear when we seek his way, not ours. We have to lay aside our own will. And so these things that are hidden are, are the pleasures in Christ Jesus. And in um, Ephesians chapter 1, it talks about that there are, God has given to us every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Every, not some spiritual blessings, every spiritual blessings, but where? In the heavenly places. So we have to seek the things that are above. And then uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, it talks about that God has made us partakers of the divine nature. So we have this opportunity to partake with the divine nature of God through the promises. That's what Peter is clear on. It's through the promises of God that we can partake of the divine nature. 
And so we seek where Christ is. We seek where he's seated at the right hand of God. We're seeking him. But why? Why, why, why are we doing that beyond the pleasures that are there and so forth? Well, he goes on into the next verse and he says, For you have died. For you have died. And your life is hidden in Christ. You have died and your life is hidden in Christ. Hidden with Christ in God. I remember one day I was at a uh, church down in South Jersey. Um, one of the first churches I went to. Um, and... They were, we were helping set up a bunch of volunteers, and one of the guys there, elder gentleman, I think he was the elder in the church, and he just, we're setting up, and he's like, Brandon, my life is hidden in Christ. And I'd be like, yeah, yeah, man, I read that scripture, definitely. Then like five minutes later, ten minutes later, it, like he kept going, Brandon, my life is hidden in Christ. And I could just tell, like he was absorbed in that scripture, and I'm just like, it started to get to the point where it was kind of getting weird, because I'm like, yeah, dude, like, all right. And then I got in the car, and it just was ringing in my head. I'm like, Lord, why is he saying that? You know? And I've learned that a lot of times when I'm having these thoughts like this and thinking about, I guess, essentially judging and critiquing people of how they're acting and things like that, a lot of times there's something hidden behind what they've done. And so I started just really thinking. I said, God, what was he saying? My life is hidden in Christ. Okay. My life is hidden in Christ. My life is hidden in Christ. And I started acting like him. I'm like, my life is hidden in Christ. I don't even know who I am unless I know you, Jesus. That was the revelation I got. I don't even know, I don't know who Brandon is unless I know who Jesus is because I've died and my life is hidden in Christ. In eternity, for all eternity, forever and ever and ever and ever, to know the goodness of God, to know the image of God in Jesus Christ is to know who the fullness of who I am and who I am intimately interwoven with Christ Jesus as the bride of Christ. Like what? I don't know who I am until I know him. Oh, come on. <laughs> I don't know who I am until I know who Christ is. I'm, I'm telling you, one of the greatest promises we have is not just that God is with us. That's an amazing promise. Don't get me wrong. But I think there's even a greater one, that God is in us. Colossians 1.27, one of my favorite verses, it says, To the saints, this is Paul writing, To the saints, God chose to make known how great among the nations are the riches of the glory of this mystery, Christ in you. Christ in you. God was hiding this revelation all the way up until from Adam and Eve, where it says, from Eve, there would come a seed, and that seed where it would crush the head of the serpent. That was uh, what, what, what the scholars call the proto-euangelion, the pre-gospel. The gospel was, is, is the message of Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection, but there was hidden sentiments of it, hidden revelations of it, in, all the way from Genesis, throughout the scriptures. And so, as we move on, we see in the text your life is hidden in Christ. You have died when Christ who is your life appears. When Christ who is your life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Jesus said before he, his death, just, just a couple days before his death, he, said, he told his disciples, pray. Jesus didn't many, make many prayer requests, like specific prayer requests of what you should pray for. And I think these are very important times when we think about what did Jesus, the Son of God, the author of life, ask us to pray about? He said, pray in Luke 22, pray that you would have strength to stand on that day when I return. I'm telling you, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord, but there will be those who are given an honor and a privilege to stand before Jesus, oh my God, to stand before Jesus Christ because of your faithfulness, because of your faithfulness in Christ. Because of your commitment, because of your radical commitment. I'm telling you, that's, I mean, part of why I, I'm, I'm radically committed to this is because, like, I was radically committed for 20 years of my life to the devil. If I can be a fool for the devil, why can't I be a fool for Christ? If I could be in the club all night till 2, 3 a.m. in the morning, partying it up, why can't I stay up late for G? Oh, my God. Come on. If I can sit for two hours and veg out on a movie, why can't I sit with Jesus for just 20 minutes? 
Come on, I'm not condemning. I'm convicted. I'm convicted. I live under conviction. I live under that conviction of God, you've done so much in my life. I've seen and tasted the deliverance of God. And it's here today. God's deliverance is here today. That's what church is about. That's what we're coming about, right? We're gathering together to celebrate the goodness of God and to proclaim it. That's, he's still doing the same thing yesterday, today, and forevermore. Delivering. Delivering. Our God is faithful. So God has given believers a victory that must be taken. Because Paul says in Colossians 2, and we're, we're moving from verse 2 to 5, where, where he says, you have died. And then notice how he says, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. For you have died. So you have been raised. You have died. This is things that God has done in us by faith. So now, what is our commission? What are we called to do? Put it to death. Finish it. Even, it's, it's a paradox, really. Because Jesus Christ said, it is finished on the cross. And yet, if we don't receive the finished work, how can we live into it? So there's a biblical pattern that I want to point out. Now we're going to jump from Colossians, and we're going to, we're going to like, I don't know, uh, like, like dovetail back into this thing. And uh, the biblical pattern that, that shows up in the scripture time and again is that God gives what we must take. God gives what we must take. Say that with me. God gives what we must take. So we read from the very first chapter of Genesis where it says, God said, behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that, uh, that is on the earth and that you shall have them for food. So God's given us the fruit of the earth, but we, can, we have to have them. You have to eat it, right? Simple. But then we move into Exodus chapter 12, verse 36, talking about deliverance. It says, And the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, so that they let them have what they asked. They had to ask. Thus they plundered the Egyptians. Jesus said, Ask anything in my name, and I will give it to you. My Father will give it to you. So, so there's this giving, but we must ask. And then we read later on that God in the temple, in the building of the temple, which is also a picture of how we as the temple of God, that the Holy Spirit is dwelling in as believers, that our, our sanctification process, is, in Exodus chapter 31, verse 6, it says, the Lord says, And I have given to all able men ability. I have given to all able men ability that they may make all that I have commanded you. He's speaking to Moses. So he told him how the tabernacle should be set up. And yet the people had to make the, the, the tabernacle. So God had given them ability, but they had to make it, right? And then we read a, our beautiful verse. Most of us know it, John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he did what? He gave. He gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So it's faith. Faith takes possession of the promise of God. Faith takes possession of Jesus Christ himself. And so, again, this biblical pattern points out this. It's a spiritual principle of partnership with God. We're partnering with God. And so in Deuteronomy chapter 1, we read, this is Moses writing, and he's talking about, see, in verse 21, see the Lord your God has set the land before you. He's talking about the nations and the land, the territory that God had given to them. And God was, you know, I had one person ask me one time, you know, if God is so good, why, why, why he ta- did, did, allowed all these people to get taken over their lands and all this stuff? There, there was a complete massacre. I said, because God is judge. And these people had been given 400 years to repent. And they didn't. And God is judge of deciding who is wicked and who is not. God determines when someone will die and when they will not. Not us. And yet through Israel, he was using them as a tool, as his tool. And he said, don't think you're getting into this land because of your own righteousness. I'm giving it to you because of my faithfulness, because I chose you. And so God has set the land before you. Go up, take possession. So God's given the land, but you got to take possession of it. Take possession as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has told you. Do not fear or be dismayed. Yet you would not go up, but rebelled. You would not go up, but rebelled against the command of the Lord your God. And you murmured in your tents. That's like us. We murmur in our hearts. God knows what we're saying. 
Come on, we can't, that's why I love getting in prayer with God and my, and my wife will tell you, I, got, I, I kind of take over her closet because she got the walk-in closet. I'm like, oh, baby, leave me alone. And I get in there before the kids are up and I am just, I pour out whatever's in my heart. The scripture says, pour out your heart like water before the Lord. Like water. Let me tell you something. If I poured out a glass of water, you think it's going to look pretty? You think it's going to be all, you know, perfectly set up? Or is it just, psh, God's not looking for this perfectionist type of mentality in our prayers. Come on, we have to be genuine. That's one of the things that brought me to Christ in the beginning was realizing, he said, I am looking for those who will worship in spirit and in truth. In spirit and in truth. And Jesus said, anyone who's of the truth, you're listening to the truth in your heart, they'll come to me. Jesus said, they'll come to me. You'll come to Jesus if you actually being, are being obedient to the truth God has set in your heart, in your innermost being. It's amazing. God's put a GPS system in us, a honing device. You know, they talk about pigeons where, uh, you know, you, um, you have the pigeons on the roof and then you can send them out and they can carry the message, but they always come back. Or I, I heard of people who had weddings and they take these pigeons and you pay like hundreds of dollars to have these pigeons released at a wedding. And then my thought was like, oh, like, that's kind of crazy. They lose their pigeons, like, but you paid for them, I guess. But it's like, no, just kidding. The pigeons return back to their home. Like the pigeons know where their home is. Do you know where yours is? They murmured in their hearts. It says, you murmured in your hearts, verse uh, 27, and said, the people are greater and taller than we. The cities are great and fortified up to heaven. And besides, we have seen the sons of the Anakim, that's the giants, there. That's where uh, Goliath descended from, the Anakim. And so, <laughs> look, at, look at how we exaggerate things when we're in faithlessness. It says, the cities are great and fortified up to heaven. Look at them cities. Come on, guys, they weren't up to heaven. I'm sorry, they weren't that high. But our doubt does that. All of a sudden, we, we, we have a simple word from God. Yes, I receive it. And then we come up to a circumstance, maybe a friend, maybe a family member, maybe a, just a circumstance, whatever it is, that gives us another word. Kind of similar to what uh, uh, the serpent did in the garden. Did God really say that? Did God really say that? I know you got that word from God, but, you know, did he really? You got to think about it. Really? Dangerous. Dangerous. So our rebellion, even, um, you know, paralleling that with Colossians, right? Our rebellion is delaying to put on what Christ has given. Put on the new self and put off the old. Procrastinating about that. Or when we murmur, we're in that unbelief of the simple word of God and blaming God sometimes. Why, why did you allow it to happen? Why did you allow this to happen? Why, why, why did I go to prison way back when? Why was I in that circumstance? Rather than seeing God's faithfulness, you're, you're allowing the circumstance to determine your faith. Rather than what God said and who God is, the very nature and character of God, to define the situation. That's what faith does. And so we, we have this aspect of God gives what we must take. There's a, ter there's a territory that must be possessed and repurposed in our lives. But how do, we, how do we take possession of this land that God has given to us? Well, another way to think about this question is how do we take what God has given or the, the life, how do we seek the life of Christ in us, right? This life of Christ is in us. He's put his seed in us for those who would believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he's returning for the redemption of mankind, for the salvation of humanity, to judge the world in righteousness. He's put that seed in us. But how do we actually seek out that seed, the life of Christ? Well, Paul says it in these terms. It's used in various terminology throughout the scripture, but Paul says, put off the old self or put to death, put away. He says it in multiple different ways, even in just Colossians chapter three. Put to death, put away, put off. And then when you're putting off something, you, look, you're not just getting rid of something to be, to be emptied, right? Every crucifixion has a re resurrection in Christ. Okay, y'all didn't hear me. Every time we're actually partaking, partnering with God in crucifying our sins, there is a resurrection to come where we will see the goodness of God, the faithfulness of God, the pleasures forevermore of God. And so 
We have this uh, putting off the old self. One um, example of how Jesus talks about that in Luke chapter 9, verse 23, he says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. Notice he didn't say take up your cross every Sunday and follow me. It would have been a lot easier. Take up your cross every, every Wednesday formation night, every, every Sunday. No, take up your cross daily and follow me. So we're taking what God has given. He's given us a cross. There's something that has to be crucified. We're partnering with God in this crucifixion. And then we're putting on the new self. Another way to say this is in Ezekiel chapter 11. It says, the Lord's speaking, and he says, and I will give them one heart and a new spirit I will put within them. This is God giving us, giving us so much good. This is the Holy Spirit in us that he's giving. I will remove the heart of stone. See, when we were outside of Christ or, or the further we are from Christ, even when we have faith in Christ, our heart is hardened. You know how often Jesus would say to his disciples, or he, he would be upset with his disciples because he's like, the hardness of your heart. It's because of the hardness of your heart. You're not believing, right? And so God's seeking to soften the heart or plow the ground, right? Plow that, that fallow ground. So I will give them one heart and a new spirit I will put within them. I will remove the heart of, I see God's removing it from their flesh and give them a heart of, of flesh, Cast away, and then he goes on to tell the people, cast away from you all the transgressions that you have committed and make yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. So that's weird. God's giving us a new heart and a spirit, but he says, make for yourselves a new heart and a spirit. You see the juxtaposition of we're partnering with God? Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, it is God who works in us both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Work out your salvation in fear and trembling, therefore. So it's like, hold on, I'm supposed to be fully responsible or am I supposed to be fully dependent on God? It's both. You need to be fully responsible with what he's given you, but you also must be fully dependent on the work of God. You cannot put one sin to death without the work of the Holy Spirit. You will be wrestling and toiling for nothing. You, will, you might have better habits out of certain things, but you'll never have the life of Christ. You see, I remember one time um, I had this dream, and long story short, I was surrounded by demonic forces. Like, I felt demons in the dream. And it, it felt like they were attacking, taking over, and, and I had this sword in my hand. And I was fighting, left and right, fighting, 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 but there were so many of them I couldn't defend myself, and they overtook me. And I cried out, and I said, God, I tried everything. I did everything. I fought with the sword, the word of God. That's what the scripture says the sword is, the word of God. I fought. I, I, I read your Bible several times. I read different verses that I'm supposed to do and how I'm supposed to do this Christian walk and do this Christian thing. Why, are they, why am I being overtaken? The moment I called out to God, whew, relief came. Similar to David when he prays in Psalm 3, he says, you have broadened my path. When I was in a tight place, you broadened my path. You see, I, while I was, was learning how to work with the sword of God, I, I also had to learn how to just fully depend on God to do the work. And I think that's even a, just a call for us today, right? Where we can, we are, sometimes we're just being too responsible maybe, or, or maybe that's not the right term for it. We're being overly dependent on ourself to get the work done rather than just fully embracing the goodness of God, what he's done, and, and saying, Jesus, what has your blood really paid for? What is the blood of Jesus Christ on that cross really paid for? Because it's paid for my deliverance. So another way to take, take this or look at this is how do we take what God has given is to put off Jacob and to put on Israel. We put off Jacob and to put on Israel. I say that because in Genesis, or in um, Oh, I, oh yeah, Genesis. Okay, Genesis chapter 32, verse 28, it says, Then the man said, Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Now again, I gave the story a little bit earlier, right? But in essence, Jacob was looking to come back to his home country, being obedient to God. God said, go back home. And now he's wrestling with this man 
who I believe is a pre, uh, pre-incarnate Jesus Christ because later on in the scripture it talks about this, there was a messenger from God sent to him and he was wrestling with him. I'm not going to get deep into it. That's a whole other study. But in short, he's wrestling with either a representative of God or God himself. And in this wrestling, he refuses to let go. And it says it, uh, the, the, the man he was wrestling with popped out his hip socket. Now, I, <laughs> I wrestled for one year. Stopped because I did, wasn't that good at it. No, I actually was pretty good, but I just, I got too nervous. I didn't like it. And, but what happened in it when I was wrestling in high school, there was one time where this guy just totally outcompeted me, outdominated me flat out and put me in a position where I had to tap out because it hurt so bad. It says that Jacob's hip was pulled out and he refused to let go. I'm telling you, don't let go when you're hurting. Oh my God, that's a message. Don't let go when you're hurting. Don't let go no matter how dark that prison gets because there is an identity in Christ waiting for you. It says that he strove with God. He was wrestling and he refused to let him go. And and the man said, the man even told him, it was God himself saying, let me go. Sometimes God tests us. Do you really love me? Are you really there for me or are you there for something else? Remember, when Jesus was risen from the dead, what did he do? He read over his disciples. It says that he was walking in uh, Luke 24 in the road of Emmaus. Remember that story? And it says that two disciples were very sorrowful about the, the death. They didn't know that the resurrection had happened. They didn't know Jesus Christ was walking right alongside them. And then later on, it says that Jesus after talking with them and encouraging them in the scriptures, pointing out the, 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 what had to happen to the Messiah to die for the sins of the people, for us, they were encouraged. And it says he acted like he was going away. Jesus acted like he was going away until they petitioned him and said, no, 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 come with us, come with us, come with us. You, you, it, it's late. You might as well stay with us, Jesus. And they didn't say Jesus, but later on, as they broke bread, it says in the breaking of bread, he was known to them. Isn't that amazing? Like you s- hold on to God. Hold on to those moments in the pain and the, in the problem and realize that you can meet God in the midst of the problem. You can meet God face to face and gain a new name, Israel, repeated over 2,500 times in the, in the Old Testament, the name Israel. Just to give you a reference, right? Jesus' name is just over a thousand times. But granted, that's only in the New Testament. So you, you have this name that is emphatic for, for any mature believer, any mature believer or just any believer, period. A believer is one who wrestles with God and the world and overcomes. John, 1 John chapter 5, verse 4 through 5 says, For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world. Our faith. Our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? That's why Jesus says, in this world, you will have tribulation. If your Bible says you may have tribulations, you might want to throw that Bible out. He says, you will have tribulation. You're going to have trials if you're really walking with me. You're going to have hard times. But rejoice, I have overcome the world. I have overcome the world. And so, For the sake of time, I want to just move quickly through these scriptures because now we're going to move into where he says, put to death, therefore. I want to read through them. And and we're just, Paul, (laughs) this is not an extensive uh, uh, systematic presentation of all the different sins we can partake in. He's just giving some of the highlights. If you're really going to walk with Christ, here are some of the big ones. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion. Passion is, the word there is really talking about an ambition that is not from God. Your self-seeking ambition. Because God is, loves for us to have passion about him. But that's not the passion it's talking about here. We have passions for our own desires, our own will. Evil desire and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. See, the wrath of God was placed upon Jesus Christ. He took the wrath that we deserved, and yet there is still a wrath appointed to come in the judgment of Christ when he returns for those who have refused to love the truth, the Bible says. You just outright refused to love the truth. The truth is Jesus Christ has come for you. He loves you so intimately and deeply. He's paid the price. It's already paid. We must receive it. And then he goes on, he says, in these you too once walked. Look, don't get, don't get ahead of yourself. You walked in these, all right? 
You're not better than anyone else. You walked in these when you were living in them. But now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth. Come on, that sideways joking that we do with our friends, with our family in those times, we've got to put it away. Is that honoring the presence of God with us? Or the anger piece? I love that one because it's not, look, <laughs> God is not looking to manage our anger. He wants to put it to death. I'll leave it at that. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off, these, the, put off the old self with his practices and have put on the new self. This is talking about Jesus Christ. You've put on Jesus, which is being renewed. It's a process, being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, uncircumcised, or circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave-free, but Christ is all and in all. We're not to make distinctions among ourselves, to see ourselves as better than each other. That's what Paul's getting at. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. These are just, I'm, just, I'm telling you, I'm running through these. We could stop on each one of these. I, I, I encourage you to stop and just pray over these in your own time, right? Pray over these and, and say, God, work this in me. A compassionate heart, kindness, humility, meekness, patience. Bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you. God's equipped us to love and filled us with love. And so we grow in that, to forgive each other. And then he says in verse 14, And above all these, put on love which binds everything together in perfect harmony, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. We have to let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts. Oftentimes we're not letting that peace rule. To which indeed you were called. You were called to this peace in one body. It's talking about even in the church of Jesus Christ. We're called to peace. And be thankful. Be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. Let that word dwell in you richly. It's just beautiful. Singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, Whatever you do, you're washing dishes, you're doing the laundry, you're working at the factory, whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It means put, put him in the front of your mind, in the front of your heart, set your affections on Christ when you're doing these things and God will reveal things to you through them. Giving thanks to God the Father through him. And so as I close, I, 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 the point that we can close on is that God is still giving. God is still giving today what we can receive in Christ. What we can take possession of. After the people had rebelled, Moses encouraged them with this word. He said, Then I said to you, do not be in dread and afraid of them, the giants in your life. Don't be afraid of those giants in your life. Don't be dismayed, or, or another word for that is disempowered by those giants in your life. I don't care if it's sin. I don't care if it's circumstance and people. Or maybe it's the job you're in or the school you're in and the tensions you're finding yourself in. Don't be in dread of that. Don't be afraid of that. Why? The Lord your God who goes before you will himself, he'll himself Fight for you just as he did for you in Egypt before your eyes. And in the wilderness where you have seen how the Lord your God carried you. Would you stand with me? I want you to just close your eyes and hear what he's saying. He said, you have seen how the Lord your God carried you. Do you see the Father carrying you? You have seen how the Lord your God carried you as a man carries his son. All the way that you went, not some of the way. You've made it to today because God carried you here. You've been brought to today because God has carried you here. He is fighting for you. He is still giving of himself to you. The cross wasn't simply the end, it was the beginning of beginnings for us, where now he is seated at the right hand of God. 
interceding for us, waiting for us in fellowship and in partnership with us. So God is willing to partner with you. If you have never received the Lord Jesus Christ, you're not sure about this, or you haven't been sure for a while, in many ways you're still in Egypt, and God wants to take you from Egypt, the land of slavery, to this world, to deliver you. And if you're a believer, God wants to allow you to take possession of the territory he's given you in your life. And so saints, will you repeat this with me? Dear Lord, thank you. Dear Lord, thank you. Dear Lord, here I am. Take and use me. Let your Holy Spirit fill me. I welcome you. And if you have yet to receive the Lord Jesus Christ in your life, I welcome you to this prayer. But saints among us, let us pray this together with those who, who might not be there yet. Let us encourage them in their faith. Lord Jesus, I receive you. I believe in you. And I want to take you in. I want to drink of the cup that you have offered to me. I want to put off the old. And I want to put on the new. I want to put to death the old me. And I want to put on the new me. I receive you. Jesus, I take you in. Thank you, Lord. Just pray with me out loud. Thank you, God. Thank you for the revelation today. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the power of your proclamation that we have taken possession of the land, Lord, that, that though the thorns and the snares might surround us, we can go forward, God, because you're removing them even today. You're giving of yourself today. God, you are the great salvation of the nations. Oh, God, and you're still delivering today. God, help our hearts to receive you, to be hungry for you, to know you more, and to seek the things that are above. Thank you, God. Church, will you join with me in communal worship as the, as the team just takes us out here? Thank you, God. Just continue to thank God. Remember how Paul said, thank God from your hearts. Bless you, God.